Hi, my name is George Jewell, author of Quantum Theory of Time. In this video, we will cover the critical concepts upon which special relativity emerged, its content, and the consequences. Most problems you see today in physics are explained by better understanding the basic concepts in these videos and in the book. It is advisable to watch them in total as they cover the topics to uncommon depths. Special relativity is a critical element to quantum mechanics done right. If you think these two topics are incompatible, then you don't know them as well as you think you do. Like every major innovation in physics, special relativity didn't just mystically appear out of a vacuum from the mind of one person. The physics community was primed for it, but not quite ready. As the 19th century matured, so too did critical studies in physics to include electromagnetism and thermodynamics. The culture of physics was trying to understand how things work, not just provide solutions. Among the topics explored were ether theories. While these classical approaches failed, failure in physics often opens doors. Lawrence and Planck were among the door openers. Lawrence's work stemmed from attempts to understand ether, but instead of producing some basic principles of the background, he opened the doors for relativity and the study of background fluctuations commonly called gravitational waves. First on the list is what should be the zeroth law as it takes priority over everything. Invariance first says the laws of physics always apply. No exceptions, every frame of reference, doesn't matter. They always apply. Second, by extension, the space-time constants set relative to context also never change. Third, by there being a zeroth law, there is a priority to the sequence of the laws of physics. This one is very important as without it, the laws are too rigid for anything to happen. The flexibility boils up from equivalence later in the laws. Equivalence is currently a popular idea for a zeroth law. It says if A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. Cute, but three apples and three oranges are equivalent but not equal fruits. This is true with space-time constants. One thing you'll notice, one thing you'll notice about space-time constants is that they have pi and the speed of light in common. They also negotiate with our units as a function of Planck's constant. The outlier in the set is Newton's constant. We will cover how weak mixing using a circular function modifies this relative to context when we cover the fundamental laws. These constants describe how linear and angular axes of space-time act on and are applied to the field. They are the same in not only every frame of reference, but any version of reality for the simple fact of pi. Pi is the ratio of the diameter to the circumference in any reality. The equivalence among these will be covered under the sixth law. Here, at the zeroth law, we simply acknowledge that whatever is equivalently worked out way down there applies everywhere the same way. This concept is critical to our next preliminary topic of background independence. In grade school, you learned to relate one axis of measure to another by means of a function. The most common ways to map space are Cartesian on a Euclidean 3D background and with co polar coordinates. These are background dimensions in that the dimensions are these units of measure that are relating to each other by means of a function and the graph giving them shape as that function. In the 18th century, Euler, Laplace, and every other mathematician of note for that matter, were using background independent variables to assemble concepts like how propagation works. These are dimensions that are evaluated into shape by context. They aren't just straight or curved lines. They are surfaces, volumes, available axes to act upon, lines of value doing the action and even assigning direction to action. The Laplace scene specifically was designed to help bridge from a background independence to whatever map of specific shape applied. That way you could convert from background independent to background dependent as you needed. We see a similar concept emerge later with the metric tensor in general relativity. Modern physics 
generalize the specific details because we have no idea what you will bring to the table to evaluate. With the cultural shift to understanding how things work, our solutions ideally include elements of the causal mechanism. A mechanism consists of naturally shaped parts like the random shapes of rocks. The fields around these smooth to simpler shapes, which is where a function like the metric tensor adapts the terrain to the field. There are mechanisms where shape is relevant, but generally, when we are trying to explain how energy and matter are constructed to describe their measurable qualities, shape is not a factor, and the interactive features are independent of each other and the function generally. Each axis begins as an open function unto itself. Context can then bound that axis to another axis and close the set into a position. Action on that position is an open-ended feature relating the position to the field. As we saw in our time and entropy videos, by doing this, we can show the quantum mechanism for motion, excitement, the phases of matter, and transformation of energy states. These things are all made possible by thermodynamics and special relativity laying out the important groundwork. A frame generalizes the manifolds. They are called manifolds because they adapt to context. The easiest way to think of a frame is to not bother thinking about the details of its shape or how they would be mapped using a coordinate system. It is simply what it is and not a set of coordinates. Thermodynamics was already doing this by combining a potential describing position with work on or by it to define a unit. The unit context is thus dependent on these two variables separately and together. We then turn around and apply that unit as an independent variable within the closed perspective of the position. The position includes its relationship with the field minus the reference point that field acts relative to. It's important to note here that in thermodynamics, the potential can be directly equal to the unit. There is no expectation of work directly relating to the unit without the potential. As a general rule, we're dealing with things that have a rest state and therefore works applies to or from that rest state and thereby, mod thereby excuse me, modifies that unit. <clears throat> the exception that we regularly bring up are neutrinos, as they don't have a rest state. Their effect is being able, unable to differentiate work from identity, resulting in changes in identity called oscillation. There are a few key points we need to make clear. First, the isolated system is simply applying the unit as an independent variable without otherwise adding or removing anything. We add and remove where the unit is the dependent variable. Second, the inertial perspective is closed by means of a cyclic function. Weak mixing is a cyclic function twisting the different manifolds into each other so they bound to each other. In 1905, thanks to solutions like Virial theorem, Einstein would know the inertial frame is angular and cyclic creating focus. Third, work was then thought to be a linear function like translation. Translation is physics speak for motion, linear motion. It is not cyclic, as Einstein's conditions declare it, for non-inertial. Translation is simple, simple and linear. We need to note there are angular forms of work that are also non-inertial. Work is always a real axis. Potential is not a real axis, but it is measured by the real value it contains. Thermodynamics introduced an idea of unit scale, which Lawrence then took to another level. <clears throat> this began with experiments to prove ether theory, showing light has a constant rate in a vacuum. Other mediums have different space-time densities, making light appear to go slower. The difference here is called phase velocity. And when things are moving, moving sorry, then the whole spectrum shifts with the change in scale. Lorentz factor makes this adjustment to show the change in scale when something is moving. His function is hyperbolic and asymptotic to a velocity of c. Every time you see an asymptote like this, 
don't make the mistake of treating it ideally as if you can keep going down that line in the real world. Every subject has a point on that line where it jumps off that rail and into another perspective. Lorentz factor is a measure of virtual entropy. For functions of the field, there is a state change to be expected at 1. But 1 is where the, this function begins. The state change for position isolated from the field is 2. As with z equals 1, these boundaries can be fudged by context. We're not worried about that right now. The main point here is that Lorentz factor already is saying the scale applied to a definition is being changed due to velocity. Velocity is challenging the energy state of position we measure as mass. Mass is a generalization. It doesn't matter what shape the mass is or what coordinate system you apply to map that shape. Lorentz factor applies to the whole thing, period. Consider Earth illustrated here on two different scales. The size of Earth didn't change, but the way the constants and units are applied does. As you accelerate Earth, the rate of time locally is slowed as opposed to that of Earth at a state of rest. But what is rest? Rest includes its cycles like rotation, orbit, and the orbit of the solar system in the galaxy. The change to motion changes the scale, but doesn't change the size or shape. This creates a conflict with space-time constants that are unchanged in every reference frame. Because of this, protons in an accelerator are given a boost, which causes them to lose part of their local value as a particle beam. By controlling these beams and sustaining the energy level with the boosts, the protons basically accelerate themselves in an accelerator. This is not how every accelerator works. Some accelerate charges independent of their sense of position. But that is another story entirely. Here, we note that the initial boost is to a Lorentz factor of 2, where state change applies. Nineteen o five is described as Einstein's miracle year. He published four papers which framed spacetime into an object of study unto itself. The first paper on the photoelectric effect got him his Nobel, the prize money he gave to his first wife. The photoelectric effect simply says that when you apply enough light energy to a surface, you can cause the electrons to be displaced and emit on trajectories away from that surface. You simply need to provide enough energy to overpower their binding energy. The second paper was far more profound. It covers the concept of Brownian motion, named after a biologist explaining how water molecules can move pollen grains. Pedasis is walking, an appropriate technical term for this. The idea was to try and understand seemingly random behavior in the field. A spiral galaxy is a, a great example of this put into a, 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 an active feature of a galaxy. It's a stage where it has enough focus to, uh, enough to form a bulge in which the systems in that bulge now have a seemingly random orbital pattern. We will explore this with isolating part of the field holding galaxy together to define a black hole as a partial Cauchy in another chapter. This is just another piece in a puzzle of trying to make sense of space-time, not just of positions, but of their effect on functionally shaping the field. The third paper is on the electrodynamics of bodies in motion. This is precisely the math shown on any site explaining Doppler radar. In this paper, Einstein sets the stage for co-movement, simplifying to a stationary observer of a moving, uh, on a moving subject. The idea is simply that everything is in motion, but the part sharing the same motion is a washout in the effect on light. As mentioned with Lawrence, we already knew about phase shift. While Doppler's name is on it, it was Fizeau who corrected Doppler and should be credited. But that's also another story. The main gist of this paper was simply about being able to gauge motion relative to light being observed. It doesn't say anything about the distribution of light or its effects. It only addresses motion. 
The framing and scaling, however, had profound implications on the entire nature of reality. If you haven't seen the entire first video of this series on time, I highly recommend doing so. The implications here help us break down time as the object of study and time is resistant by regulating the scale of effect. This is also a bridge leading to uncertainty principle. Consider the observer and observed going in opposite directions approaching the speed of light. They eventually can't observe each other at a point called the co-moving horizon. The fact they wouldn't survive that motion is beside the point. This is a boundary where wave collapse applies and there are other variables that will contribute to that shift like distribution. There is a common classical mistake made with the concepts emerging from this. Galilean relativity is about changes in position, not changes in scale. It is often confused with Minkowski's 4D model. The Galilean model is only focused on the axes of motion and time being x and t complete with their units. Other dimensional axes like y and z are simply ignored. Minkowski conversely developed a model using x and t as manifolds but without units. One manifold describes the unit of position and the other the scale applied to that unit. It says nothing about the change in position or the shape of anything. It doesn't care about x, y, z coordinates. Any sense of coordinates or units of space or time are simply generalized into these two manifolds. The 4D model isn't three spatial coordinate axes and a time axis. It is a space axis, a time axis, then changes upon just those two axes. Minkowski, Minkowski left behind a slide from a presentation, then inconveniently died, leaving explanation to others. Einstein repeatedly addresses the confusion, but not very clearly. At least, not too many, and it doesn't seem to be all that clear. As we saw with Newton in the first video on time, there's some awkwardness at the onset of any pursuit. We have to be more understanding from a perspective of modern science experience what they were trying to say. Among the profound effects of the co-movement paper is Doppler broadening. In this diagram, we see electron energy levels filling off of a full spectrum, then emitting in bands. The energy level solution was fulfilled by Niels Bohr. Doppler broadening is where the heat in a system causes parts to move in different directions at different rates with relativistic effects. Their specifics are phase shifted due to the co-movement difference causing the bands to statistically smudge as an entropy function. Yes, hiding in plain view of this equation is an entropy function. It's a virtual entropy function. Then we have co-movement relative to the general source. We notice this also has a z function and each z function is a virtual entropy function. These virtual entropy functions are functions of the field with direct effect on scale. Distribution then applies its own virtual entropy function. To some extent, you can separate these, although the last two are a bit problematic. The entire spectrum is shifting relative to motion and then distribution. A way to tell the difference is focus. Distribution directly affects focus. The angle of motion affects focus, but motion itself doesn't. The combined effect of motion and distribution have a point of wave collapse where the total z value at one changes moving, co-moving perspectives. Doppler broadening gives information needed for directional effect. Up to z equals one, this light is like the sun burning one side of you, or the heat of an oven blasting only one side of you when you open it. After z equals 1, the energy is free of directional effect, like the background temperature in the room. It gets all of you. It surrounds you. You're basically in it instead of being exposed to it. It is for this reason that z equals 1 is the limit to our ability to measure distance or motion. There is no clever workaround because uncertainty principle applies. We cannot know, and any thoughts otherwise is un are unfortunately 
unprovable speculation. The conformal effect of distribution, commonly termed dark energy, is explained by Huygens' principle. In 1671, Huygens postulated that as a wave propagates through a medium, each point on the advancing wavefront acts as a new point source of the wave. Distribution of radiation loses energy, whereas ordinary light loses density. By losing density, it doesn't lose the original energy identity, but it does lose focus and flatten the front, creating a virtual redshift. I say virtual because the information involved is relative to a level of generalization. This co-moving information has directional effect. This effect applies specifically between ultraviolet and infrared on the spectrum. Within the infrared, it reduces to free energy. A virtual shift indicates some of the energy is changing states. You lose magnitude and flux density, which affects luminosity used to measure distance. Of course, we can't be expected to see all the distribution, so it is reasonably termed uncertainty and accounted for using a Hamiltonian like Hubble's parameter for adjusting the depth of field observation to recover focus. Co-movement and conformal effects as a virtual phase shift are easily indistinguishable and together lead to the same result of wave collapse shifting perspectives. As illustrated here, the phase shift transforms from local to general perspective as a tangent function generalizing change on the virtual axis. Up to this point, co-moving variables are distinguishable and directional effects apply. At this point, a part of the directional remains and reduces to free background energy along with general background, while the remain typically combines to a higher order and when it does, Doppler broadening applies and the initial energy level is reset. There's a lot to this third article of 1905. We will visit some more in a couple minutes. The fourth paper was energy equivalence. It presented the famous equation E equals mc squared. Equivalence was to be expected following thermodynamics and its first law of conservation. Mass is the energy state of position. While everyone recognizes this one, what is important is the conversion to other states like propagation, motion, and the background. The last statement of relativistic momentum is equivalent to adjusting the unit by adding work to potential. We are saying essentially the same thing in a different way. Which state applies depends on the context. Contextual analysis is done by quantum mechanics. While QM was not yet formalized, it is still the best way to understand thermodynamics and special relativity. Two apples and two oranges are equivalent numbers of fruits. They are only equal in quantity, not quality. By recognizing energy equivalence, Einstein revealed a universe of energy. This compelled him to pursue what is called a static model of the universe. It is static because conservation is ultimately a zero-sum game. It's as if nothing happens in a really profound and complicated way. Upon hearing Lemaitre's Big Bang model, Einstein declared it the most elegant thing he'd heard. Then he went home and kept working on a static model because it just didn't cut it. Later in the book, we will integrate both of these models. Einstein, upon occasion, said things in a sort of doublespeak. The same is true with quantum mechanics as his response to Big Bang. He contributed significantly to QM on many levels. Sure, they had some debates, but in the end, it wasn't a competition for ideas, just a conflict of perspectives. Then there's this. This statement perfectly fits the two main approaches to QM. Did he mean it that way? Maybe not, but it works. He liked having control of the variables because he's a problem solver. Bohr was more observationally oriented, so naturally he was dealing with probabilities. Despite the seeming conflict, Bohr's QM provides for both perspectives. It is definitely the most adaptive scientific methodology available. 
Einstein refuted what he dubbed spooky action at a distance because it appears to violate the speed of light. A virtual hypersurface is proportionally conserved. It doesn't propagate like real exactly conserved value, so it isn't subject to the speed of light. A virtual hypersurface definition contains the parts defining a whole. Action upon that generalization is simultaneous to that whole. It is a frame distinct from its content, while the content is subject to C, the frame is not. The most confusing part of this is what entanglement has a different face for every context. Sorry, but wormholes don't make the cut. Similarly, on elementary levels, the bands do provide channels for exchange of value among microstates. But as elementary particles simplify, so too does the role of entanglement. The same hypersurface as a gluon band evolves to the role of phases like solid, liquid, and gas, then to orbits and other ranged connectivity. Hydraulics are a common use of this hypersurface. Pascal's law was established between 1653 and 1663. It states a pressure change at any point in a confined incompressible fluid is transmitted throughout that fluid simultaneously everywhere. The change applies to the whole as a unit frame, a null axis relating the real parts, but itself is not real. That is why it is simultaneous. Einstein argued this was a point of incompleteness in QM. With a better understanding, this problem explains itself. Un Uncertainty in the field are synonymous. There are three ways to look at the field and its virtual sense of diversity. These three lead to three related statistics. The Fermi Dirac statistics consists of a field of discrete points that exclude each other. Adding value among them will divide them, just as adding heat to ice makes it melt. The Bose Einstein statistic is the opposite perspective, where the field is a real energy pattern, but not discrete. As a measure of emptiness, it is like adding water to an ice tray. You reduce the diversity available. Boltzmann's model is simple and mechanical. Adding energy to the system does something, but it doesn't change the diversity because it is in balance between the other two perspectives. Each model is measuring the virtual axis in a different context and the effect of adding value to that context. The virtual axis is the null unit frame opposite to the content. As opposite the frame of inertial fermions is non-inertial and it increases diversity. The frame of bosons is conversely inertial and decreases diversity. If you interpret boson behavior by fermion standards, then the universe is expanding. The universe, however, is a combination of both. Propagation of real value affects both the field and things in it, so the effect cancels as mechanical. The expansion interpretation was a big problem in Einstein's attempts to model matter. It wasn't the only problem. One of the key conclusions of special relativity is that spacetime does things. To show this, he took 10 years to develop general relativity. In that solution for gravity, he uses a system of index notation. Index notation is a brilliant idea, but as we will see in the later chapter, it needs a few adjustments to account for evolutions and logical interactions. Without these, you can't simplify from the field or unfold from the field into focus. Unfolding into focus requires understanding better how manifolds adapt to context. In 1932, Einstein gave up on trying to solve the problem of creating matter. The expansion interpretation is blamed, but as I just noted, there are a few other reasons. While special relativity gave us a lot to start with, it didn't jump into the logic of ch logics of change or provide methodology for integrating ideas. These are the purview of QM. Einstein was convinced QM was incomplete. Approached incorrectly, that is indeed true. Approached correctly, it helps to complete what relativity cannot. The lesson lessons of special relativity are basically the framework of good science 
and the methodology of QM. As we saw, relativity simply assembled the facts we already had. These led to a set of conclusions about the natures of energy and reality that were testable, then tested, and confirmed beyond doubt. Even the parts where Einstein objected to that entanglement ended up being proven true. It also reveals that when you start injecting expectations, you also begin manufacturing problems and sidetrack away from the facts. You cannot exclude or negate one set of facts due to another set of facts. All the valid solutions are true to their context. It takes stepping outside your local comfort zone to a more general view to see how the diversity of contexts work together. In future chapters, we will see just how many and monumental the hurdles were in Einstein's way to achieving his 1932 goal. The goal was achievable, but just not in his frame of mind with notions of exclusion, tidy solutions, or the facts he had to work with. Please remember to like, subscribe, buy the book, and leave a review. Until next time, have a good day.